Um, my name is Arthur Samuelson. I am the program director here at the Rose Center. Um, we have been here for almost 100 years. Um, we were started in 1924. And in the last 50 years, we've been running weekend programs such as uh, this one. Uh, only on site, um, what we now call on site, we just called it our programs. Um, we run those programs on spirituality, personal growth, all the creative arts, nature, communication, and social change, all things that we think go into living a flourishing life. And that's what we try to give people at all stages of their life. Of course, in the last two years, uh, we had our own challenge of how to do that and went online for the first time and discovered that we could do things in two dimensions that we couldn't do in three, um, like reaching people all over the world, engaging workshop leaders from all over the world. And because we could price our programs much less, ex much more, much less expensively and people didn't have to travel, it also opened it up to people for whom who would otherwise not be able to come to us. So it's been an exciting two years for us, um, a challenging one. Uh, nobody here has gotten COVID. We've made all sorts of changes to make sure that, every, that we and everyone who comes to visit us here are safe. Um, and um, um, and so I'm hoping, Fia just, uh, um, um, Fia is my colleague who's speaking from New Hampshire. Fia, why don't you wave hello? Fia is our host for, almost, for all of our online programs and for many of our in-person programs. Uh, she just posted in the chat the URL for um, Edward's upcoming program in two weeks, um, of which this is meant to be a taste. Um, so uh, it is my delight and honor to be able to introduce you all to Edward S.B. Brown. Uh, Edward began his Zen practice and cooking in 1965 and was ordained as a priest in 1971. He uh, is the author of the Tassajara Bread Book uh, and the Complete Tassajara Cookbook and No Recipe. He's the editor of Not Always, So, Zen Lectures by Suzuki Roshi. The most important point, a collection of Edwards lectures was published last year. And he's the subject of a critically acclaimed movie, How to Cook Your Life. Uh, and he leads workshops on liberation through handwriting and mindfulness touch. How many, I'm just curious before I turn this over to Edward, um, how many of you, know him through the Tassajara cookbooks. Yeah, how about that? Okay, Let's well, I'm, I'm offering you a different kind of treat. Edward, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. <sighs> um, good after, good evening, good evening. I'm in California, so I say to myself, good afternoon. For most of you, good evening. If others are on, then um, we could uh, wish them other times of day, depending on where they are. Um, I'm looking forward to um, spending some time with you. Um, And uh, the theme uh, that we picked for today that I picked is uh, uh, getting out of our heads. So um, I'm not gonna be sitting here and talking uh, for that long. <laughs> um, and the first thing I'd like to do is to suggest that you take a few moments to uh, enter into your body. Uh, there's a poem by Kabir, he says, enter into your body, there you'll find a solid place to put your feet. Think about it carefully, don't go off somewhere else. But in this case, since we're sitting, 
uh, we could say, enter into your own body, there you'll find a solid place to have your hips uh, and to be uh, connected with the earth. Uh, and generally uh, to, uh, you know, shift your awareness from your head and your thinking uh, into your body, you need to move a little bit. So I often encourage people to lean forward and back and side to side. Uh, and when you move like that, then you can start to notice your hips. Uh, a lot of the time we, uh, you know, put our body someplace and we park it. We park our body and and then we're going to be busy meditating or doing something uh, in our heads. So right here at the start, if you take a few moments to begin to feel your body, and especially in this movement, uh, forward and back and side to side, you'll start to sense your bone what is solid in your body. And you'll um, likely, if you're giving your awareness to it, you can you'll notice your pelvis, the bowl of your pelvis, your hips. And you'll notice where your weight uh, is connecting with the cushion, the chair. And if you're sitting in a chair, you can have your feet flat on the floor and you can notice your feet and the bones of your feet. And you'll start to feel uh, quite likely, you know, when you start to notice your pelvis, you'll notice that there's the possibility of helping your pelvis find its ease and stability. And this is different than if you just uh, sit down and you, uh, you'd you like to think your pelvis will do what it's supposed to and what you want it to do without you actually having much of a relationship with your pelvis, it will, it will do uh, what it should. And you know, our way of being uh, mirrors the way of our culture uh, some people are now beginning to suggest that colonialism, which goes back in Europe 500 years or so, you know, some people are now suggesting that we all have uh, a form of neural colonialism. You know, it's in our bodies, in our consciousness. So, of course, our hips should just do what they're told because we're in charge of the empire up in our heads. And those beneath us will do what we tell them. And we'd rather not hear from them. Uh, whether th them is, uh, you know, people of color or indigenous people or poor people or people with disabilities or, you know, the, it, the list goes on and on nowadays of people who would like to have a voice in this uh, world. But it's also in each of us. How do we, um, and how do we shift this? So we'll look at all of this today for a few minutes. And we're starting with, you know, asking our hips, our pelvic pelvis, are you comfortable? Are you good where you are? Can I move forward and back a little bit or side to side so that you'll have a little more ease and stability and you'll be able to uh, connect with the earth and you'll be able to support me. So we're, uh, instead of uh, just assuming, making assumptions or telling the other how to behave and what it needs to do, we're having, we're cultivating relationship. Are you good here? A little forward, a little back, side to side. And what would bring help you to be uh, stable? Because the more stable your pelvis is, 
the more it will be at ease. The ancient uh, Chinese philosopher Xuan Tzu said, easy is right. Begin right and you are easy. Continue easy and you are right. The right way to go easy is to forget the right way and to forget that the way is easy. So once you've uh, established or found your pelvis and your hips, and you can, then you can connect or sense the earth that is supporting your pelvis. You're sitting on the cushion, a chair, and you can feel the way you receive the support of the earth. And as you choose to, you can send energetic roots down into the earth, very fast growing energetic roots that can go all the way to the core of the earth or find some solid boulders to wrap around. And these roots, they're yours, so they know what to extract or bring up from the earth that is nourishing, supportive, full of vitality and well-being for you, for your body, for your being here. The earth supports all of its creatures, including each of us. And you can feel the earth energy then coming up into the floor of your pelvis, through your pelvic bowl, into the abdomen, the lower abdomen, middle abdomen, upper abdomen, side to side, front to back. Nourishing, vitalizing, energizing your abdomen, up through your diaphragm into your uh, lung cavity, chest cavity, Again, filling your chest with ease, joy, vitality, energy, sparkling warmth. Up through your shoulders, out your shoulders, into your arms and hands, up into your neck and head. And often again, a little movement as you feel this energy uh, bringing you vitality. And then what I'd like you to do is, as you um, connect with, you connected with the earth, the ground, and you can ask the ground where you are to connect with the ground where I am. And this is again, very curious, but um, you know, we each have our own ground and we share the same earth. And this is uh, similar to, of course, consciousness and being that we each have our own consciousness, our own being, and it's something we share with everything. So it's not just, um, when we do this kind of uh, activity, it's not just, um, you know, an exercise. Uh, we're re-inhabiting our bodies. Uh, because largely, um, we've learned to live in our heads. And re-inhabiting the body uh, is then also re-establishing or re-inhabiting our fundamental being. So, you know, the possibility for our own uh, ingenuity, creativity, resourcefulness, uh, intuition, imagination, it's all here uh, inside. And it's not just a matter of how, how do I do this? I just go ahead and do it. 
I can step out of, uh, as it were, step out of or move out of my head into my body, into my being, connect with the earth and grow tall inside. So then you can also, if you would, ask the space that you're sitting in to connect with the space where I am. Uh, and we have this uh, way then of uh, connecting with each other. Uh, you know, uh, so-called uh, energetically or uh, so-called, uh, you know, in spirit. Uh, and there's, um, when we've, uh, some, again, we're re-inhabiting our body. Some people call this reincarnating into your own body. And so there's this uh, possibility that as a practice, you could... Um, you know, uh, embody, be embodied. And not just in your head, not just living in your head in the realm of thinking, um, but to be embodied. And from this embodied place, um, noticing the flow of phenomena, the flow which sometimes coalesces into things which we call people, which we call sensation, which we call emotion, which we call the world. And sometimes it's flow. And we can't exactly tell what's what. And just one degree or another, we're learning, uh, you know, to trust this flow of being which we're an aspect of or a manifestation of all being. All of being appears as you, as me, as each one of us. Uh, in the world of our heads, we have things and we have people and others and and we end up in various realms of thinking, like how do I get them to do what I want? How do I get to myself to do what I want? And so we're thinking that there are all these uh, separate objects and things and emotions and how do, I, how do I take charge of my life and how do I do this and how do I do that? And, uh, and in this realm of uh, being, we're noticing that there's a, a flow we can trust. Or if you know, uh, uh, the most common example, one of the most common examples is going out into nature. And today, you know, uh, earth, the earth is um, a kind of representative of nature. The earth has its own uh, fundamental coherency Uh, and when we um, settle ourselves in this coherency, or if we walk in nature or practice finding our pelvis and connecting with the earth, we begin to notice that uh, any dissonance dissolves in that coherency. Uh, and from time to time, we'll find that other possibilities appear to us, not because we've thought of them or we've figured out, we've figured out the other possibilities, but they, they arrive, they come. 
and we have some sense of, oh, that's what to do. And when we stay in our heads trying to figure it out, uh, we can't, there's no answer, there's no solution. So we're finding, of course, in these times, um, which this has been always been true, but you know, we're reminded even more strongly with COVID and even post COVID that we can't figure this out. Um, but when we um, re-inhabit ourselves, we can find, um, we find ourselves doing something. So I'd like us to, I'd like to suggest, and you know, um, this is a, just a little bit of time, but I'd like to continue now with coming to standing. And I wanna lead you in a bit of Qigong because, um, and it, you know, I call it Qigong, but uh, it's actually, you know, otherwise known as Edgong because um, I'm not certified to be a Qigong teacher. Nobody has said, oh, now you can teach our Qigong. You know, because everybody claims that Qigong is theirs. And most people who claim Qigong is theirs claim that theirs is the best. And of course, you wouldn't want to do a Qigong that's less than the best, would you? So do our Qigong, you know, and, um, and take our classes and, um, you know, help us grow our uh, image in our business. <laughs> but my Qigong is free. It's on YouTube. It's called Ed Gung. And you don't have to pay anything. Um, and Ed, you know, and Gung is for, you know, the stuff that you do. So I don't try to do someone else's Qigong. I just do my Qigong. And so I'll share it with you. And then it be, can, can be your Qigong too, as you decide to do it or not. So, but it's a wonderful way that I found uh, one of the most effective um, to, and perhaps it's been useful. And by the way, at the very end, you know, if you leave soon, if you leave early, you can always invite your ground back to where you are and your space back to where you are and not leave it with me. You don't have to leave it with me. You take it back whenever you want. And at the very end, I'll have everybody do that. Okay, you got it? So are we, we're good so far, we're okay, we're, we're coming along. If you need, we're gonna go, I'm gonna stand, I'm gonna turn the camera around, I'm gonna be standing. And if you need a, you know, water in or water out, you know, wander off and come back as you're ready to do so. Okay, so we're good. All right, so I'm going to stand and you all can figure out what you want to do. And I'll turn this around. And... Uh, let's see here. Oh, I need to. Oh, there I am. Uh... See, I think I'm going to um, pin myself or whatever it is here so I can get my, oh, I know, I, I can go to speaker. There, now I'm larger. And the, yeah, now I can see myself, okay. So I'm gonna stand and then you can uh, stand and we'll do a few things. As I said, uh, and you can hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, one of the things I do first thing in the morning is I have the coffee going and I raise my hands up to the height of my shoulders and let them drop. And I do this for eight, 10 minutes. The people who do this uh, do like 40 minutes. So I stole this from them or now it's mine because I do it. But they say that three minutes a day cures everything. <laughs> but they do, um, you know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. And, um, and they love doing it, you know, by leg. You, you stand at a leg and look out across the leg and swing your arms. And this is just, I find it amazingly, surprisingly effective in like being willing to be here. You know, after just getting out of bed and maybe having had a shower and waiting for the coffee. And the coffee cooks much faster uh, when you're swinging your arms like this. 
Okay. So um, uh, this is uh, one thing you can do. Um, and then um, this is also, so this is one school of Qigong and I do, as I say, about eight minutes the first thing in the morning. And then, but this is also while we're doing our qi, uh, uh, continuing with our Edgang, this is your resting pose, you know? So if your arms get tired, you're, you're rubbing your hands together and you, your hands are tired, your arms are tired, swing them a couple times and then come back to what we're doing. Okay, so you'll see that I swing my arms from time to time. And so that's also a resting pose. It's a school of Qigong and it's a resting pose in my school. <laughs> All right, so um, ah, let's go ahead and rub your hands together. And by the way, your feet are about hip width apart. And usually it's helpful if you're, you know, your feet are about parallel. Okay, and then you're gonna bring your hands up. And um, this is, by the way, washing your face. You start with your hands at your forehead and bring them down your cheeks. And at the end, your thumbs can come along the corner of your jaw and just under your jawline. But I'm just showing you that because um, that's part of another routine I do, but um, I like to do that a couple of times leading into the first uh, in this series is taking your forefinger, your first finger and rubbing it up and down on your nose. Uh, or your nose is solid up by the eyes. And often you, you may feel like sighing or yawning. So in this school of Qigong, you get to sigh or yawn whenever you'd like. And sign or yawning uh, is considered to be, you know, helping you wake up. It re uh, it reestablishes your breathing. It it, uh, it it's sign and yawning are both ways to release tension in your breathing, and it will help you wake up. And then the so then uh, so this is a good one for uh, helping you sigh or yawn. And then if you want, you can come across the bottom of your eyes and up into your, uh, across the top of your, the bones of your sphenoid, and then also out the side here. And then first finger back and forth on the upper lip, right under the nose. This is a very important consciousness point. I studied Qigong for a while, not Qigong, but acupuncture for a while, point right there. If somebody goes unconscious, you wanna wake them up, put the needle in there. So this is uh, acupressure, massaging, waking up point. And if you have a problem with cramps, which I have never used to happen when I was younger, but as I've gotten older, you get a cramp in your leg or thigh or calf, foot, you take your thumb and first finger, pinch your nose there, and the cramp goes away. It's an amazing uh, point anyway, just to say. So after uh, we've done this with each hand, then uh, one finger behind the ears, three in front of your ears, up and down. This of course is the corner of your jaw, you're massaging and, you know, we like to chew on things and it's a good way to keep um, things uh, in your head, to chew on them or to cleanse your teeth, to grind your teeth, chew, chew, chew. And this is seeing if we can release or relax. And it's not like, you know, we shouldn't think about things, but if that's all you do, then you know that's a big limitation on your life. So letting go of some of that thinking. Okay, and then finding your arms and bringing your hand around your arm back and then up over your head. And then in the other direction,
Some of you have probably done MBSR and when I took MBSR training with John Kabat-Zinn, he said, a lot of people, and when they first come to MBSR, you know, they get their arms up to here. And, you know, but you, you, you know, if you want to have the range of arm movement, you need to suggest, you know, see, like, can we do this? <laughs> and it's, uh, again, this is a, you know, this is simple to do. One of my inspirations for Qigong is uh, Suzuki Roshi's uh, wife, Mitsu. She used to go into the courtyard at Zen Center and do Qigong every day. 25 times in each direction. In her 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, she lived to be 102. And when she was 102, she could still move her arms. <laughs> So this is a little bit like, um, you know, my ex-girlfriend who was a dental hygienist, she said, you only need to floss the teeth you want to keep. So you only need to move the arms that you want to have as you get older. All right. Um, excuse me for going on like this, but anyway, taking both hands and then patting shoulders up the back of the neck, back of the head, up to the top of the head and back down. And wonderfully enough, and not surprisingly perhaps, but the arms and hands are intimately connected with your heart. So unbeknownst to, or not so obviously, when you do these things with your arms and hands, you're waking up your heart. You're connecting uh, your vitality, consciousness, awareness, and giving life to your heart by moving your arms. Okay, and then down the outside of the legs, patting down the outside of the legs, patting up the inside of the legs. Down the outside. Up the inside. Okay, and then one more with the padding. With your hand out, with the palm facing down, pat down the, the top or outside of your arm. <laughs> Palm up and pat up the inside of the arm. Down the outside, up the inside. So in acupuncture, um, Chinese medicine, the uh, yin channels come up the inside of your arm and the inside of your leg. And then the yang channels go down the outside of the arm. So up the inside, down the outside, up the inside. And the swing in the arms, you'll notice that one feels a, a lot better. You just patted it. And then the other arm, patting down the outside, turning the palm up and patting up the inside. This Qigong has a motto, you know, I've mentioned you, you can sire yawn if you feel like sighing or yawning, but this Qigong is known as easy in the beginning, easy in the middle, easy at the end. And it's uh, the motto of the school is no pain, no pain, no pain, no pain. <clears throat> ah, and here we are back, uh, here I am, back with swinging my arms. Let me check the time. How are we doing? Okay, we, we'll take a few more minutes for this. We're gonna do one more simple thing, which is um, you can have your hands, if you can do it, you have your hands comfortably on your pelvis. And then we're gonna do the simple movement of turning to look to one side.
and bringing your head back to the middle and turning to look to the other side. And this is uh, an endless kind of study because we're very much involved in that. Are you, are you busy giving out the instructions and directions to your head and neck? Get over there, get back here, go over there now, do what I say, follow the instructions, do what you're told. Or are you, are you, are you able to step out of that way of being and sense your head and neck moving through space. So to step out of your, out of your mind, out of your head is to begin to just sense the sensation of your head and neck moving through space. This is the big shift from living in the objective world to living in the inner world as well or what Zen Master Dogen called taking the backward step that turns your light inward. It's kind of feels like a backward step. What, I'm not in charge anymore? I don't get to tell everything what to do and how to be and what it, what it needs to do to please me? And why are things so recalcitrant they don't just they're not here to please me what's with that they need to do listen to me more and do what i tell them so just to feel your head and neck moving through space and generally you know as you slow down you can start to sense more And you can look around, uh, you have your eyes open and you can look around and you can remind yourself this, this is today. In our head is all the stories about what happened. So whether it's, uh, EM, what is it, EMDR, MDSR, you know, uh, I've done various therapies and you, you look from side to side. Now it's just part of EDCOM. This is today. Thank you for surviving what you went through because now we're here today. So coming back to the middle, the second movement is looking up, looking down. Uh, and in my school, you we've added you take your arms up, turn your palms up, stretch your arms back, and then lift your head up, inhaling, looking up, exhaling down, your palms are facing back, inhaling, uh, palms are out of up, exhaling down, inhaling, looking up, exhaling, looking down. So the rotational movement is about emotional body, flexion extension about the volitional body. What are you fundamentally here to do to be? And you begin to be in touch with that as you do these, you know, over time, especially as you do these movements. So finishing up with that, the third movement, this is by the way called the four ways the dragon moves its head. So we're going on to the third way, which is uh, a side bending. And it's just 60 or 70% of the movement. And again, sensing as carefully as you can the sensations of your head and neck. And the inward sensibility of You know, you're almost dreaming or it's a poetic imagination. Things can come to you. You're available for connection. Rather than you're busy following the program or the agenda of get over here, get back there, now do this, now do that. That was wrong, that was right, that was good, that was bad. 
keeping up a running dialogue of assessments, thinking that if you got good enough at it all, you'd finally gain the approval of the invisible voices that are the authorities in your own head. Ah, well. So uh, this side-to-side -side movement uh, is the, uh, the thinking, associated with thinking. You know, it's tilting your head to the ground, your ear to the earth. What do you have to say? Coming back to the middle, and then the fourth way the dragon moves its head is uh, some a circle, so slow, easy feeling. Side, forward, side, back. And your head and neck aren't really made to move in a circle, so it's actually a little bumpy. If your feeling of this movement is smooth, then you're busy doing it rather than sensing it. Because you can do it in a smooth way. And with this kind of activity, if you feel like pausing, you can pause. And especially if you come to a place, you kind of come to a little bump. If you're gentle, uh, you'll come to bumps and then you can pause at the bump and then there you are, two years old, three years old. And you have uh, implicit in your body memories. And normally in our everyday activity, we're overriding, of course, the memories because you've got things to do. Okay, we're going to come to a pause, find a place to pause, go in the other direction. In Zen, there's an expression, take off the blinders, unpack the saddlebags. So stop trying to get somewhere. <laughs> See if you can be here. See if you can show up here and see what it's like to be here in your body in this place at this time with your body, with your mind, with your heart. Okay, and coming to a finish somewhere, bringing your head back to the middle, we're going to do one more. Uh, feet wider, a little wider apart for this. This is a version of uh, what's called the rainbow pose. And with your feet a little wider apart, you turn one palm up and rotate in the direction of that arm so it's behind you. And you look back at your hand and then bring it up over your head and follow it with your head and eyes up over your head, creating a rainbow and reaching out to the opposite side, coming down. And new hand in the back, palm up, comes up over your head, across and down. And you can reach out so that the movement of your arms and hands uh, leads to your whole body moving. So when your body, when your arm goes, so you can lean out after that arm and then lean back, new hand up in the back and you lean. And so we're doing all the movements. We're doing the rotation, flexion, extension, side bending, and all three movements are included in this rainbow pose. Okay, coming to a finish. So I'll tell you a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye uh, about this, uh, you know, how we're getting somewhere. So her poem is, this is the uh, poem called The Red Brocade Pillow. Uh, the Arab side is saying that when a stranger comes to your door, feed him for three days before asking who he is, where he's coming from, where he's going. That way he'll have enough strength to answer. Or by then you'll be such good friends, you don't care. 
Let's go back to that. Rise, peel up. Here, take the red brocade pillow. My child will get water for your horse. No, I, I, I wasn't busy when you called. I wasn't planning to be busy. That's the armor everyone put on to pretend they had a purpose in this world. I refuse to be claimed. We'll snip fresh mint for your tea. I, I think that's all I can remember at the very end. I refuse to be claimed. Here, have another helping. We'll snip fresh mint for your tea. Anyway, um, uh, we're going to sit down again. So thank you very much for standing and uh, spreading your wings. That's another poem, if you want another poem. <laughs> I decided to memorize poems, you know, because when you memorize poems, you have them in your body and not just in your head. And I like having things in my body and having my body be alive rather than everything's in my head. So um, I'm going to offer you another poem, since I was just reminded of it in stretching my arms out. Uh, it's a poem, uh, Robert Bly's poem, What is Sorrow For? What is sorrow for? It is a storehouse of barley, corn, wheat, and tears. One steps to the door on a round stone and the storehouse feeds all the birds of sorrow. And I might say to myself, I say to myself, oh, go ahead, be stoic in the autumn, be calm, or in the valley of sorrow, spread your wings. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, thank you for spending some time with all of this. Um, and we have about 10 minutes left as far as I can tell. So I'd like to take a few minutes to see if there's some comments or questions, observations, reflections um, that someone might be willing to share and bring forward with the group. And of course, if you come to Roe, we're going to meet face to face, and then you'll have plenty of opportunity to to mouth off, <laughs> or or is it, you know, expressing your truth? We don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I have other poems, by the way. If you if you if you'd rather not say anything, I'll tell you some other poems. Um, so, anyway, please, if someone has a question, comment, reflection, observation. I was just going to, um, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to um, go out and um, I'm trying to, I'm learning how to be a poet. And um, I also noted that through the Rose Center, Kim Rosen has a program and oh, um, she has uh, a, a book that talks about um, the value of memorizing uh, poems. Oh. And I'm just, um, yeah, I really appreciate the program today. I need the invitation to uh, be in my body. And I, I like that 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 linkage feels like e an even bigger invitation of, yeah. of, of poetry and being in my body. Thank you. Yeah. You're very welcome. Yeah. Very welcome. Thank you. It's good to have these kind of uh, markers. Oh. And then start to notice when I'm in my body and when I'm not. And if you don't have some marker, then you just like, how does this all work? What's, you know, what am I doing right or wrong? And, and we think that we, that we can do things by what we hear or what we're told. And if, and if, and if, and how do I get my life to go better? Well, I need some better instructions. I need some better directions. I need somebody to tell me what to do because my life isn't working out. <laughs> So a Zen teacher said, you know, speaking of poetry, see with your eyes, smell with your nose, taste with your tongue, 
nothing in the world is hidden. What else would you have me say? And of course, what you want him to say is, how do I get things to come out more to my liking? <laughs> and, uh, and he says, let it, you know, see what you see, smell what you smell, feel your feelings, think your thoughts, see what you want to do with your life. And find yourself doing it and give yourself permission to go ahead and do those things and surprise yourself. Uh, someone else today. Thank you, I didn't get your name, was it Beth? Or just, uh, yeah, okay, thank you, Beth. Someone else? It's so, it's, I haven't seen you in over 30 years and- um, Oh my goodness, who is this? Uh, Sally Greenhouse. Oh, Sally Greenhouse, good afternoon. Hi. Good evening. I'm in the middle of a virtual retreat with Gil Fronstall. Oh, really? And you yeah. took time out for me? Oh, my oh, goodness. Totally. Oh, oh, yeah, of course, Ed. Are you kidding? Um, <laughs> I and Whenever I'm in any kind of retreat, and now I'm virtual on this retreat, I'm in Massachusetts. I haven't seen you for since long before my neck was broken. My neck was broken. And, oh, and so we're, you know, I the this is what I remember every retreat that I do cleaning the kitchen with you um we were on the late night shift and I and it was a 14 or 21 day retreat and um I was in the kitchen in that large kitchen kitchen at Santa Sabina and yeah I, that's what it sounds it, like Santa Sabina yeah it, the image comes back to me at every retreat I've ever done of you in the kitchen and I and I was really grumpy and very grim about cleaning the kitchen that was my job and and I thought to myself who's that guy running the glasses through the Hobart um pretentiously wearing black robes like he's a zen priest um, <laughs> wearing, um seriously seriously because I was coming out from New York you know and it was California I thought I, I don't know who that guy is, but we're on kitchen duty tonight. It was really late and I'm very grimly cleaning. And I kept kind of looking over at you with the glasses. And I thought, whoever that guy is, who's trying to look like a Zen priest, the way he's touching the glasses, they're ordinary glasses, but he's touching them like the priceless crystal or something. He's got some weird delusion that he's a Zen priest and now he's, he thinks the glasses, <laughs> he's, he's treating every glass like it's a work of art. I mean, we're just cleaning the kitchen and every glass, this ordinary glass is like a work of art. It was so weird. And I was completely, then I would go back to my own grim you know I got to clean this part of the kitchen and I was throwing something away in one of those large round waste baskets with the plastic liner yeah yeah and I looked down and I looked down and at the bottom of the waste basket was like a little stuffed rabbit clapping its hands squeaking up at me and I thought have I ingested something hallucinogenic? And and then I heard this laughter and it was you. Um, and you were holding this little rabbit at the bottom of the wastebasket to make me laugh. <laughs> and you were laughing. And, and I thought, this is so trippy. And I looked at you and I just burst out laughing. It was like 1130 at night, you know doing my assignment and I didn't know who you were and then like several days later at, at the end of the retreat you stood up and it turns out you really were a Zen priest. <laughs> 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 um, I, what, what, I couldn't believe it that all the assumptions that I made it taught me so much like I have tried to describe 
you in the kitchen to so many people who don't care. Like they're not paying attention to me. And I just said, if you have not seen Ed Brown in the kitchen cleaning glasses, then you don't know anything about, you know, the kitchen and cleaning. And, and by the way, I don't cook, you know, and I'm a Virgo. I don't like to do anything over and over again, but you were doing it like it was the most precious, you know, it was really taught me so much. That whole retreat was just you in the kitchen and remembering that on every retreat that I've done since then. So I just want to thank you. Okay. So We're coming. Thank you so much. You know, you've, you've, you know, Arthur said, now be sure you, you know, advertise this weekend, this workshop with you coming up, you know, and you've done it for me. Um, well, Ed, I mean, so just listen to Sally. You're, <laughs> oh, but you're amazing. I wish I could come. I so wish I could come, but I've been in isolation for over two and a half years. So oh. I, I, and I'm not that far from Roe, but I saw that you were coming. Yeah. I'd anything if I could be there and just hang out with you for the weekend. Thank All you right. so much for-, for You're the welcome. Thank and, you so much. It's lovely memories. And oh, just- <laughs> Yeah, oh, really oh, am a Zen God. priest. <laughs> and you really are a Zen priest. And there's- and I've got my, I got my guy up there, you know, I'm, I'm his disciple, you know, uh, yeah. Sukhur's disciple. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just, I would, I wish so much I could be there in person. Yeah. Okay, if thank you. you. Me, I'm going to miss you. All right. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. So one more poem. Uh, this is a poem by William Stafford. Um, you know, he's gone. Um, but William Stafford, of course, is most famous for, uh, you know, his his expression. Uh, he was interviewed one time, Mr. Stafford, I, I understand you write a poem every day. And he said, yes. And he started writing poems when he was in a, con uh, not a concentration camp, but a, he was in a camp for conscientious objectors in the United States. Uh, and he started writing a poem every day. And so for years, he wrote a poem every day. And the interviewer said, how can you do this day after day, day in, day out, and you write a poem? How can you be that inspired day after day after day? And he said, I lower my standards. So uh, this is one of his poems. That's great. <laughs> um, uh, every day. Uh, tomorrow we'll have an island. Tomorrow we'll have an island. Before night, I'll find it. Then, on to the next island. Places like this, these places hidden within the day, separate and come forward if you beckon. These places hidden within the day separate and come forward if you beckon. But you have to know they are there before they exist. There will be a tomorrow. There will come a tomorrow without any island. So far, I haven't let it happen. But after I'm gone, others will become faithless and careless. And before them will stretch the wide unbroken horizon. Before them will tumble the wide unbroken sea. And they will stare at the horizon the empty horizon without hope. And they will stare at the empty horizon without hope. So to you, my friend, I confide my secret. If you want to be a discoverer, hold close whatever you find. You hold close whatever you find. And after a while, you decide what it is. Then secure in where you have been, you turn to the open sea and let go. Ah, so on you go to your next island. Um, before we, um, so before we go, I promised that if you invited your land uh, to uh, connect with my ground, um, invite your ground back to where you are connecting to the ground around you.
uh, and invite invite your space if you had to connect with my space back to the space where you are connecting to the space around you and understand of course that you have that anytime you can connect with your ground with your space and we each uh, all of us live in this large space on this great earth uh, thank you so much for being here and some of you perhaps I will see you at row and if not uh, let's do, let's find other occasions <laughs> all the best blessings